Hi, I'm Joan Newberger, editor of Not Even Past, and today we're here with Denise Spielberg. Hi, Denise. Hi, Joan. Denise is a specialist in Islamic history, the history of the Islamic world, and she has written a brand new book, it's just out, called Thomas Jefferson's Quran, Islam and the Founders. Um, it's a brand new way of looking at Thomas Jefferson. How did you find out that Thomas Jefferson had a Quran? Well, actually, there was an article that was titled How Thomas Jefferson Read the Quran, which I wasn't expecting to find. But also, of course, Thomas Jefferson's Quran was used by our first Muslim congressman, Keith Ellison, mm -hmm. in his private swearing-in ceremony. Mm -hmm. um, I knew that Jefferson had a Quran, but when there was the media attention over its actual use by an American congressman, I couldn't believe it had survived. So there was the finding out part that he owned it, and then there was the fact that it still existed. Mm -hmm. So that meant immediately that I wanted to see it. But I also wanted to set it in context of Jefferson's intellectual life mm -hmm. and his diplomatic life mm -hmm. and his thoughts about religion. Uh, and, and actually, the book takes each of those topics one at a time, right? Yeah. In fact, Jefferson is probably the founder who had the most complicated and interesting interaction with ideas about Islam and even with Muslims. He met two Muslim ambassadors during his lifetime. Mm -hmm. He negotiated with both of them, one in London in 1786 and another one he had at the White House during uh, the, the first Tunisian ambassador to the United States, the first Muslim ambassador to the U.S., who came to Washington and even had a state dinner with Jefferson at the White House in 1805. Mm -hmm. Well, let's back up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, how, did, uh, um, how did Jefferson acquire the Quran? Did he buy That's it? A good how question. Did he find it? Yeah, in Williamsburg, we see that there is attested in the local newspaper, the Williamsburg Gazette, which was also the bookseller, a line written by someone else that actually says Thomas Jefferson uh, sales Quran, two volumes, and it was 16 shillings. He bought it in 1765, and that's what the records tell us from that newspaper. So e 11 years before he wrote the Declaration of Independence, he was buying a lot of books, but this one was the most famous translation of the Quran, the only one that directly translated from Arabic into English. And he knew that an Englishman had done it and wanted to buy it. So he, it was sent to Virginia from London. Mm -hmm. So he knew something about Islam and its holy book before he bought it, um, or do we, we know that? We don't know that, actually. And the interesting thing is that he had this Quran with a 200-page introduction that was one of the best introductions to Islam, one of the least distorted then available. Mm -hmm. But unlike other books, um, he didn't we don't think or know, take notes on his reading of the Quran in 1765. And that might be because there was a fire five years later that destroyed all his books and papers. Mm -hmm. So there's even the possibility that this book he repurchased, mm -hmm. that he might have bought the Quran twice, because it does survive, and we still have it. And, and almost all his books were destroyed in that fire, Yes, right? that's right. He says, almost all my books were destroyed in papers. And he said, if it had been money, I wouldn't have thought about it. But he really lamented that. So this was a period of time when he was taking notes on important texts. And he may have taken notes on the Quran, but perhaps they were burned. We don't know. Well, you are arguing in the book that um, Islam had a, his study of Islam and his interaction with Muslims had a major impact on his thinking about what kind of state the United States should be yes. and the role of the religion in citizenship. Mm -hmm. um, uh, did, Islam ha did this study of Islam have an impact on his ideas about religious toleration? Do you think it was fundamental to his ideas of religious toleration? Well, actually, it seems as if he was very much like other founders, some other founders, but men of his time in that what he wrote about Islam was not often complimentary. And sometimes it was wrong, which mm -hmm. suggests that he wasn't a true student of the religion, although he was clearly interested. But the notion of the relationship between religion and the state, and it, it, it devolved upon the idea that 
Muslims might one day be citizens. And this is an idea he acquired by buying another book, basically, by reading John Locke, mm -hmm. who was his hero. Mm -hmm. And we know that Jefferson thought about Muslims as potential citizens because in 1776, a few months after writing the Declaration of Independence, he makes a note in his personal papers. And he's, he records that Locke said, neither pagan nor Mohammedan, meaning Muslim, nor Jew, ought to be excluded from the rights of the Commonwealth because of his religion. Mm -hmm. So even that early he was thinking about it. And even earlier, in 1765, um, while still a law student, which is one of the reasons he bought the Quran, he was immersed in legal studies. We see that he took notes for, for his cases um, based on laws from around the world. And so since many people thought the Quran was a book of laws and really only that, he probably used it for that reason. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, he encountered a legal precedent an earlier British legal precedent that said that Muslims were not perpetual enemies in, in British legal thought. Mm -hmm. And he wrote that down. He wrote that precedent down, too. Mm -hmm. So this was a world in which there were Muslims. Muslims had been in contact with the English for a very long time through trade um, and other peaceful means, as well as through some forms of naval conflict. So he, he develops these ideas on the basis of reading Locke and on the basis of these other, reading the Quran probably earlier. Yes. Um, but then, uh, as you said, he has interaction with uh, Muslim diplomats yeah, he and statesmen. Did that change the way or reinforce his ideas or how, how does that impact his ideas? It's interesting because at the time, you know, John Adams talked about, um, we after independence, there was a problem with uh, our fleets in the Mediterranean and the Atlantic commercial fleets being preyed upon by these North African corsairs who happened to be Muslim. And he and Adams interviewed uh, a, an ambassador in London from Tripoli about this, trying to put an end to this kind of depredation. And the fact is that Americans didn't have the money to pay for a peace treaty that would have kept them safe. And whereas Adams see this sees this conflict in religious terms, Jefferson saw it in completely pragmatic terms. Mm -hmm. Even at the end of his life, he doesn't use Islam as a lens through which to uh, feel that these pirates were anything other than lawless. All pirates were lawless. Mm -hmm. And he had written earlier legislation about pirates that probably, or, or losses at sea, that probably referred to the British during the Revolutionary mm -hmm. War. So he was thinking in universal categories, but he wanted to end the conflict. So on the one hand, he thought a preemptive military strike would be good. On the other hand, he had these ideas about individual Muslims, at least theoretically, as future citizens. Mm -hmm. So there are complications in his thought. Mm -hmm. and, and they are kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, there, there was a lot of uh, pressure and um, voices calling for the United States to be a Protestant country. Yes. Right. Um, and you said earlier that um, he was influenced by ideas of toleration. Mm -hmm. um, uh, how, uh, can you talk a little bit more about that, about where his ideas of toleration came from and the other founders? And uh, did he have a, was it a hard road to convince people that the United States should be founded on a concept of religious plurality? Well, what we would call religious pluralism today was a completely radical thought in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't unknown. You know, ideas about ending violence toward fellow Christians because of different religious opinions existed in Europe from about the 16th century. So when people started to talk about ending the persecution of heretics, their, their immolation, whippings, all kinds of brutal physical punishment, the earliest people who wanted to put an end to this, really in the name of Jesus and Christianity, also began to think about including Jews and Muslims in this sort of protected status. Mm -hmm. And out of that, we see a discussion uh, by a few people who were willing to risk their lives, really, to be banished or exiled or put in prison, to say simply that the government ultimately, and we see this with early English Baptists, too, that the government, particularly the king, has no right to interfere in a person's religious beliefs. Mm -hmm. And that, that that religion should be separate from government control. And that these early Baptists who were suffering extreme persecution, uh, the one I'm thinking of died in prison in England, suggested that not just Christians and Christian heretics should be uh, pr protected from 
the wrath of the state, but so should, so should Turks and Jews. And so we get a universal category mm -hmm. as early as the 16th century. We see it move to England in the 17th century. So it wasn't really just John Locke. Mm -hmm. And the, the book attempts to point out that there is a longer arc of these thoughts about tolerance mm -hmm. that morph into state toleration, or at least the idea of it. Across the Atlantic with Roger Williams, we see this also in the 17th century. And even though Jefferson never read Roger Williams, his thoughts are not unlike. The difference is that Roger Williams believed that Muslims and Jews and others would be damned, whereas Jefferson didn't care about people's salvation. What he wanted was a civil society in which there, were not, there was not violence in his state or in his country based on difference of religious opinion. And he witnessed this persecution uh, by Protestants of fellow Protestants in Virginia. So when he was thinking about religion and the state, he also started to think about non-Protestants. Catholics were scary to Americans at this point, but there were about 25,000 in the United States. Mm -hmm. Jews were a despised minority of 2,000. And Muslims come up as a category in the European context, but I think they were put together, particularly with Jews, because those were the two groups that Christians found the most threatening. Mm -hmm. And when we think about the evolution of universal toleration moving into Jefferson's thoughts about rights, what we see is that Muslims probably marked the furthest limits of inclusion in the American state as it was theoretically laid out. Mm -hmm. Because there was so much misinformation about Islam, there was so much fear of it, we were in, you know, our seamen were being taken and, and, and captured in North Africa, and yet still Jefferson insisted, as did others like George Washington, that Muslims should be theoretically included. Because if they were included, then everyone could be tolerated and everyone might eventually have civil rights. Mm -hmm. So it's either really all or nothing. Mm -hmm. Is that? Yeah. So um, uh, were there any Muslims in North America in the 18th century? Yes. In fact, there were probably Muslims in America since the 17th century. And Jefferson didn't know that, right? And Jefferson strangely seems unaware. So all of his theoretical forecasts were probably not only futuristic, but they were about a sort of imagined category of Muslims. Whereas ironically, among the, the West African slaves taken... Uh, and suffering in, the, in, in, the, in America under the British and also in the United States were a segment of Muslims, a segment of believers. We know this because some of them were literate in Arabic. They had learned Arabic before they were enslaved in West Africa, and they wrote, they wrote in Arabic. But Jefferson, who was probably the champion of Muslim rights, never knew that these uh, Muslim slaves lived in America, and he never knew that he might, in fact, have owned some. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we usually see, if, if people retain their Islamic names, we see this. We can't say it for sure with Jefferson, but Washington, who was not far from him, on his, taxable, his list of taxable property, we see two names of women named Fatima and Little Fatima. Mm -hmm. And Fatima is the name of the prophet's daughter. Yeah. So, so Washington, who actually also had these beliefs about religious liberty as a universal, and who also mentioned Muslims included in that category, ironically owned Muslims and didn't see that these ideas about rights were in conflict with, with, with then notions of race and slavery. Mm -hmm. So that's the biggest contradiction in all of this, right? Yeah. You, can, you can map out rights, you can talk about a future with Muslims in the country, but at the same time, you're oblivious to the Muslims who are there. And that you own them and that they're slaves. And that, and that they don't have them, any rights. And that the idea of rights of any kind is obliterated by this, this slavery institution. Um, what, what are the implications of this research for today? Well, in the afterword of the book, I try to talk about the fact that, as in the 18th century, Muslims, Jews, and Catholics were often linked together as outsiders. Mm -hmm. And that once the theory of uh, civil rights and, and religious liberty included all three groups, they were technically accorded these rights, right? There's no religious test in the Constitution. Freedom of religion, all religion, is guaranteed in the First Amendment. But in truth, Jews and Catholics struggled into the 20th century to realize those rights against 
amazing bigotry. I think the difference is that Muslims now are in a position uh, that, that Jews and Catholics once were, that they are a group that's often targeted as somehow not fully American. Mm -hmm. When we have a diverse and, a diverse and dynamic American citizenry who vote, who live here, and who have been guaranteed rights, not just in terms of our documents, but historically, mm -hmm. um, those who would suggest somehow that American Muslims are not full citizens probably need to learn more history. Mm -hmm. And I think for that reason, this research is really important to see the, the origins of the state that we live in um, included, this very broad co universal concept of, of, uh, of religious toleration and rights. Right, and, and in fact, you know, this is essentially the principle that supports inclusion. So you're either going to include everyone. I mean, even Je Jefferson even mentions Hindus in his notion mm -hmm. of those who should be included, uh, not just for with religious liberty, but also with actual rights and potentially access to political office. Mm -hmm. So in fact, when we see Congressman Ellison elected, I don't think it's in spite of his religion. I happen to think it's because of it, mm -hmm. that there was a place for that. Mm -hmm. And that that was- For electing a Muslim. For electing a Muslim, that that's the logical outcome of these prescriptions in the 18th century. Well, thank you very much, Denise. I think it's a fantastic book. Thank you. And I hope it's very widely read. Thanks, Joan.